Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that showcase. This has been a crazy project to say the least. <laughs> it's taking me about a month. I started it right after the Tetris build. You can check that out if you want. So it's it's been a little over a month, but um, I had a ton of fun doing it. A lot of challenges, a lot of really cool stuff. I'm gonna give a summary of how it works first and then we'll get into the higher level details. Before I summarize how this works, it's probably worth it to just go over what a graph actually is again. It might sound silly, but the way I think about it is a graph is just a bunch of points and it's all of the points that make the equation true, right? So if you take any of the points along this line and you plug it in for uh, y minus x, you should get zero and then therefore zero equals zero and that's true. So that is what y minus x equals zero is, all the points that make it true. Speaking of points, I just realized I never actually specified what the units on this thing are. I was going to, and then I forgot. The bottom corner here is negative 50, negative 50, and then the top corner is 50, 50. So it starts at the origin, it goes out every direction, uh, 50 pixels. And each pixel is two by two, so yeah. But anyways, back to how the graph works, right? I told you what a graph is, that makes sense. But when you think about it, that means that if we want to graph something on this screen, we have to check every single point and see if the equation is true. So that's literally what this thing does. It takes your equation, it plugs in the points for, or I mean, it plugs in the values for X and Y, and it checks if it's true. If it's true, it plots the point. If it's not true, it doesn't plot the point. And it just repeats that for every single pixel on the screen. Now, since the screen is 101 by 101 pixels, it means we have over 10,000 pixels to check. And that's the reason why this is so ridiculously slow. It's because whatever, no matter how fast you can get this, you're gonna have to run it over 10,000 times. Um, even with Carpet Mod, that rotated ellipse, which was the longest equation I showed, took 30 hours. Um, if you didn't have Carpet Mod, that would just take weeks and you wouldn't be able to use this at all. So that's how it works on paper, but let's see, let's start to look at some of the components to see what it actually looks like. When you first type your equation, it gets stored in the orange part. All these repeater locks are just memory cells that store all the characters of your equation. Um, so when it gets red, it gets shifted out of this orange wall here and it gets transferred into here. And this right here is where each character of your equation gets read one by one. Now, after each character gets read, the goal of this device is again, just to see whether what you typed in equals zero or not. So we have all different types of things, like tools that we need in order to do that. We have the lime green is a giant multiplier, the r blue is a BCD to binary device for the coefficients, and the red is a giant adder subtractor to keep a running total of all the terms. But if none of that made sense, don't worry. All you need to know is that after everything gets read in your equation, this line right here is either on or off, and it's telling us whether it equals zero or not. And as you can see, it's connected to the screen. So we either cancel this comparator and don't write to the screen, or we don't cancel the comparator and write to the screen. And again, we do that over 10,000 times. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the components and how they actually work. Um, I took out a bunch of them here. This blue one is um, BCD to binary. What that means is it takes a BCD digit, which is just zero through nine, but in binary and it's gonna convert it to a binary number uh, as you keep adding on BCD digits. So what I mean by that is, let's say you type in 123 to the display, right? As it reads one, it has a one in the machine. Then as it reads two, we want it to have 12. Then if it reads the three, we want it to have 123. And that's exactly what this guy does. So if you put in a one, and by the way, this is one, this is two, this is four, and this is eight. So if we put in a one and we press this button, we get one. Because as far as we know, there's no other characters and that's it. But now if we put in a two and we press this button again, we get a 12. This is an eight and this is a four. Eight plus four is 12. And if we do three, oops, two and one is three, then we should get 123, 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus eight plus two plus one is 123. So this machine's great. It can handle any coefficient. It just keeps adding in the digits and will gradually get whatever that coefficient is resembled in binary. But for X and Y, those are actual multiplication. And not only that, but it's multiplication by up to 50, right? Because X and Y go from negative 50 to 50 
And so at some point, if you have x to the fifth, we could be doing 50 times 50 times 50, you know, five times. And that requires a lot of bits and a giant multiplier. That's exactly what this is. So this is the input. And if we, uh, the reason it's six bits is because that lets us fit 50, right? We can do 32 plus 16 uh, plus two, and that's 50. And the output is over here. So let's first multiply 50 by one. So that's 50, that's one. We've repressed this button, takes a little bit of time, and we get 50, 50 times one is 50. Now, we don't need this one anymore because now what it's gonna do is it's gonna take whatever's in here and multiply it by the input. So we have 50 right here. So let's try multiplying 50 by three, okay? 50 times three. is 150. This is 128, 16, 4, and 2. So we have a way to deal with coefficients. We have a way to deal with x and y. The last thing we need is a way to combine terms together because um, you're basically, you're typing in an equation, right? You could have plus or minus in between your terms. You need a way to count them all up. And so that's what this red thing is right here. Uh, I didn't pull it out to show you guys. I, I should have, but... <clears throat> It's just an adder and uh, it can also have a subtract mode on it. That's what this part is out front. If you power this guy, it turns it into a subtractor. This entire line gets powered and then it inverts the, uh, the input and also adds one to it. If you didn't know, that's exactly how you turn an adder into a subtractor. You just invert the, in, uh, the input and also add one to it. So like I said, it's in charge of keeping the running total of all the terms. As the green and blue guys, you know, figure out what the actual term value is, it either adds to the total or it subtracts to the total as you run through the equation. And then by the end of it, this guy should have our final answer in it. And the last machine I want to show you guys is, uh, I just call it the XY machine, honestly. It just keeps track of the X and Y values um, at any time. So if you, if you notice in the videos when it was plotting it, it started on the bottom row and then it went left to right and then it went to the next row up, left to right, next row up, left to right. And if you keep hitting uh, the count button on this machine, it will adjust the values accordingly all the way through, all 10,000 of them. So <clears throat> this top row is X, this bottom row is Y. Uh, this bit out front is whether it's positive or negative. So I think just zero is negative and uh, one is uh, positive. So right now we're at 51, right? 32, 16, two and one. We're at negative 51, negative 51 x y and that right there is actually the bottom left corner of the screen and so if we hit count we want it to start moving left and in order to start i'm sorry start moving right and in order to start moving right x has to start increasing so as we hit that count button i don't know if you noticed but x went up by one we went from negative 51 to negative 50. if you keep hitting this button x continues to go up so now we're at like 33 or something, negative 33. Y hasn't changed yet because we're still on the very first row. But if you keep incrementing this enough times, you'll get all the way to the right of the screen. And eventually, right there. Now we're on the second row because Y got flipped from negative 51 to negative 50 and x got reset back to the very left, which is why it's back to negative now. So yeah, I mean, it just keeps track of the values as you go through it all, super, super useful, honestly pretty compact in my opinion. These are just binary counters that can go up and down, so yeah. And finally, let's talk about the screen. So yeah, it's 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 gigantic, but <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I'm gonna talk about. What I'm gonna talk about is how we actually plot the values because I've actually been lying to you a little bit. Um, yes, a graph is where the equation equals zero, but if you try to do that for a bunch of points, it's gonna look really bad. And so we actually need to change the algorithm a little bit to make our graph look a lot better. So let me show you what I mean. This is some code I wrote to actually simulate the graphing calculator. Um, our equation is right here. Right now it's on y minus x, which is the same thing as, uh, it's y equals x, because this function right here 
is set equal to zero. Um, and so right here, the method we're using to graph it is the method I've been talking about this entire time, where we're saying, if it equals zero, we draw the pixel. Otherwise, we don't. And so let's see what that looks like for y equals x. And surprisingly, it actually looks pretty good. But there's a problem. There's actually a huge problem. If you add a coefficient in here at all, then look what starts to happen. It starts to have holes in it because this is actually y equals 5x. And y equals 5x, these points right here are the only integer values that actually work. Like everything else in between, if you look at the actual point there, they're, it's, it's in between integers. They, 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 they don't show up using this method. And if you start doing squares, the problem just gets even worse. This is y equals x squared, and it just looks horrible. <laughs> if you try to do the ellipse, I mean, you might get four pixels. That's about it. So we need another option. Um, so my next thought was, all right, it has a bunch of holes in it, but it can still kind of graph it, right? It's still kind of there. So what if, instead of uh, equaling zero, we set it to equal a range? Like, we would see if it's within some uh, threshold. Um, so let's test that out. And that's actually method number two down here. So I'm going to comment out method one. And let's turn on method two. So I'm going to set this threshold value right here equal to five. And what this is going to do is it's going to almost do the exact same thing, except now, instead of seeing whether it equals zero, it's going to plot it if it's between negative five and five. So let's see what happens. Uh, let's just do uh, a slanted line first, uh, like this. And I mean, it's thick, but there's no holes. So it's not too bad, right? Let's try y equals x squared. Well, OK, it's thick in some parts, and then it gets thinner in others. And on top of that, there's still holes in it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. So at that point, I was like, OK, there has to be a better way to do this. And then <laughs> method three. Method three is absolutely beautiful. It is just as simple as method one and method two except there's no holes, there's no change in thickness, and every single graph you plot will just look perfect. So let me explain what method three is. Let's take an even closer look at what method one and method two are exactly doing before I jump into why method three is so incredibly amazing. So method one took our equation, for example, y minus x equals zero, and then each pixel was assigned a value. So this one was assigned 0, 0. This one was assigned 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1. You get the idea. So they're all assigned an integer value. For every single pixel, we plug in y minus x. If it equals 0, we light up the pixel. If it doesn't equal 0, we don't light up the pixel, right? That's method 1. Method 2 was almost the exact same thing except instead of saying if it equals zero, it just looked at whether it's between uh, negative five and five, something like that. So method three fundamentally changes because instead of putting the values on the pixels themselves, it puts the values on the corners. So we're gonna pick a random corner and let's call it zero, zero. So let's call this corner right here, zero, zero. And then from there, we know that this corner is 0, 1, this corner is 0, 2, this corner is 0, negative 1, and yeah, you get the idea. So let's fill out at least some of these here. And so what method 3 is going to do is it's still going to take y minus x, but instead of seeing whether it equals 0, we're going to just see whether it's positive or negative. That's all I care about. I don't care about anything else. And we'll just call zero positive for now. So if it's zero or greater, it's positive. If it's less than zero, it's negative. And we're gonna take that at every point and we're gonna just assign it to all the values just like before. But they're not pixels anymore, they're corners. 
So on every corner, we're either gonna have a plus or a minus, whether we got a positive value for the equation there or a negative value for the equation there. So let's actually work through what that looks like for y minus x. All right, I filled out all the corners. Let's start to work through what these all are. So y minus x at zero, zero, well, that's just gonna be positive because zero minus zero is zero. Remember, we're calling zero positive. At zero, one, it's one minus zero. One minus zero is positive. 2 minus 0 is also positive, but negative 1 minus 0 is negative. So we're going to put a negative sign there. And then you keep working through. 2 minus negative 1, positive. 1 minus negative 1, positive. 0 minus negative 1, positive. Negative 1 minus negative 1 is a 0, which we're calling positive. 2 minus 1, positive. 1 minus 1, positive. And we start to get this shape like this triangle of pluses now stay with me 2 minus 2 is also positive and now if you look at any of these we're actually going to start to get negatives here this is what 2 2 1 yeah so uh 1 minus 2 negative 0 minus 2 negative negative 1 minus 2 negative 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 and i'm going to use a different color for these let's use red here for the negatives and let's use green for the positives so method 3 says now that you have all the corners and you have them all assigned to either a positive value or a negative value you're gonna do the following you're only gonna light up a pixel if it has a mixture of pluses and minuses. In other words, if it has all pluses on its corners, don't light it up. And if it has all minuses on its corners, also don't light it up. But anything else, go ahead and light it up because then it has to be a mixture. So let's do that, look what happens. We get this pixel, we get this pixel, we get this pixel, we get this pixel, and we get this pixel. We don't get this one, it's all pluses, all pluses, all pluses, and we don't get this one because it's all negatives. And what this method does is it still graphs y equals x, except it does it more in an organized fashion. It looks exactly where it changes from positive to negative, and that's giving us a much, much more accurate picture of the graph. It doesn't affect the thickness, it doesn't, it doesn't ever create any holes, it doesn't do anything like that. So let's actually see this in code now. Back at the code now. I turned on method three and let's see what happens. So we've got y equals five x. If you remember, this one just had a ton of holes in it. And it looks great. It's y equals five x except drawn with pixels because all the ones on this side are positive and all the ones on this side are negative. And each of these pixels just has a mixture of pluses and minuses and it looks great. So let's do y equals x squared. Remember this one had like the thick at the bottom and then the thin on the top. Still looks great. It completely fixed all the problems. You can even do something bigger like um, let's do a circle. So y squared plus x squared minus, I don't know, let's just do a thousand. <laughs> I mean, it's just perfect. So once I knew that method three was definitely the way to go, it was just about making the circuit and I just could not make the circuit. I couldn't make it compact enough um, because the input is really, really close together. There's only one block of space in between. And same exact thing for the output. There's also just one block of space in between. So I went to my Discord, called up my buddies and said, hey, can someone make this please? And uh, John did it. My friend, uh, his username is John Defun. I'll put his YouTube channel in the description. But he's an absolute god at compacting redstone and he made it. So this lime circuit does exactly that. It takes the corner values as the input and it gives the pixel values that we need as the output. In other words, if all four corners are the same, it doesn't plot the pixel. And if they're a mixture, it does plot the pixel in this tiny amount of space. So huge props to him. Thank you so much. And that's pretty much all I got. I'm starting to lose my voice again, which is amazing. Um, but if you have any questions, you want to learn more or anything like that, please just join my Discord. Um, I love talking to you guys, hearing your questions about this stuff. It's really cool. Um, I hope you learned something. Hope you got something out of this. Hope you enjoyed it. 
Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace out.